I, you know, conscious of time constraints here, I'm going to speak in shorthand, uh, and so I'll address both the time frame, the six-month time frame, and also constraints, and then just give an overview in terms of what to expect from a stylistic perspective and also from a policy perspective. So uh, the Honorable Bakoyanis, Dora Bakoyanis, talked about the next six months. I think that time frame has just been foreshortened. Um, the debate was disastrous. It was a debacle, and anyone who viewed just the snippets was probably frightened by what they saw. If you watched the entire debate, you should be shocked, because it was even worse than the snippets. So what you're looking at right now is not only a weakened candidate, a presidential candidate, you're looking at effectively a weakened president. And so the weakened president is currently sitting in the White House making decisions, and of course it's not just us observing that, it's our adversaries and those who are considering these three fronts and how to behave within the realm of, of geopolitics. Highly frightening. I believe that, and I'm not in the business of predictions because I've been a foreign correspondent most of my career and an academic currently, but I believe at this point there's about a 50% chance that uh, President Biden will be the candidate going forward. I think there's just too much pressure uh, following that debate in terms of how he looks and how he's likely to appear come November. So it's a bold prediction. It's not one I make happily, but it is unfortunately what I feel is currently the case. In terms of constraints, um, I feel that um, it's very difficult to look at the first administration, whether it's the Biden administration or the Trump administration, and project forward how they are going to likely uh, act. What we just saw yesterday in the United States was a Supreme Court decision that effectively has created what could be an imperial presidency. In other words, the constraints that have existed and that existed during the first Trump administration were those of personnel, were institutional, uh, there were any number of constraints, not merely those of resources, but rather of, of people who were able to hold back some of the president's worst instincts when it came to foreign policy. He now has had four years to reflect upon that. He has been embattled in terms of the courts in any number of other ways, and he's articulated his, his feeling that, in fact, this next administration will be unconstrained from a policy perspective. So those instincts, whether it's implying that uh, South Korea should have its own nuclear weapon or whatever it is that, that he sees as being a bold uh, project and policy is one that he can likely more easily implement without the types of personnel constraints and policy uh, and institutional constraints that have existed in the past. And then finally, just to kind of give you a sense of how I have uh, shorthanded what you're likely to see, and, and this depends in part on who the candidates will be, whether it's Trump or any Democrat. Remember, um, the only person who likely enters into this uh, campaign with foreign policy experience are Trump and Biden. If there is not a Biden candidacy, then you are likely to get a governor of some sort, and in general, governors do not have a whole lot of foreign policy experience. Usually when they're elected, they are tested immediately once they come out of their election. And so expect, again, these adversarial uh, relationships that we have and those, and those uh, conflicts that we're currently observing and participating in will be challenged even greater at the beginning of any non-Biden or non-Trump administration. But let me just give you my, and this is, again, a shorthand version. Um, should it be a democratic outcome, you can expect a more predictable versus an unpredictable approach. We saw those, and I don't think that's really open to too much uh, 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 competition in terms of the understanding. There's institutional approach, again, on the democratic side, versus an individualized approach to policy. There's more tactical response on the democratic side versus a more transactional approach. Uh, there's a more enterprising, and that means whether it's putting together alliances, Sweden and Finland, versus, for example, a, a more entertaining approach, which means you have to play to a populace in some cases to be able to move policy along. I might say there's more of a collective versus a colluding approach. Uh, and finally, I'd say, you know, it's a, a wounded presidency versus an imperial presidency. Um, let me just close out by saying there are some things that uh, there is consensus on in the United States that affects our, gen our, our uh, geopolitics. China is one of those things that 
surprisingly, almost across the board, we have 100% consensus. So expect more aggressive um, actions uh, against Beijing, uh, in part in reaction to what Beijing is doing, but in part because there is a sense that this has to happen. Uh, on trade, you just saw 100% tariff applied in the United States on electric vehicles. I think you'll continue to see a lack of multinational trade agreements, regardless of whether it's Democratic or Republican. So expect more pressure, much more uh, industrial policy coming out of the United States. Uh, in terms of alliances, however, there is not a consensus in terms of how do you plan and perform in alliance structures. And of course, from my perspective, on wars, the approach to wars is very different, and we can talk about that if you care in the follow-up. And in energy, I will pass that on to John Sidalides.